This is an unofficial audiobook with original content belonging to Wizards of the Coast. This content is covered under the fan content policy established by Wizards of the Coast. Listener discretion is advised. The Gathering Dark by Jeff Grubb Prologue The Cage The temporal boundaries of the age known as the Dark are indeterminate. Trying to set down when it truly began and when it truly ended is akin to determining the exact moment that dust begins and when the day finally and fully surrenders to night. Most scholars and theologians agree that the dark began with the devastation of Argoth in 64 AR and it extended several hundred years until the continent of Teresia was at last firmly in the grip of its ice age. None of those living during the time of this period would have identified themselves as living in a dark age when civilization slipped from the golden days of the time of the brothers. For them, it was merely their everyday life, and if the days grew colder and the world more dangerous with the passing years, who could truly notice? It was a time when the old nations collapsed, when goblins swelled their numbers in the hills, and when city-states quarreled and feuded under the onus of a tyrannical church. It was also the time when magic as we know it came into full bloom, when the basic truths of modern spellcasting were first set down. During this ancient period, the first true convocation of mages occurred, carrying the spirit of Teresia City, combining their knowledge, and encouraging their brethren in the exploration of this new art. Arkel, Scholar of New Argive In the depths of the catacombs beneath the conclave citadel, Lord Ith screamed in the darkness. It was a ragged scream of lungs long since worn raw. He had been screaming for some time now, he realized, not knowing when one wail began and the last one had ended. Indeed, Ith did not know if his own voice was loud as it seemed in his ears, or if it was only the wheezing gasp of his breath against the silence that enwrapped him like a soft muggy blanket. Lord Ith, former ruler of the Citadel, former Lord High Mage, former supreme power of the Conclave, that collection of necromancers, thaumaturges, mages, and spell dabblers, realized he was thinking about his screams as opposed to just continuing to scream. He clung to the thought. Other thoughts accumulated around the edges of this first thought. Fragile, flickering embers that could be nurtured, then banked into flaming moments, even hours, of lucidity. It was futile, he knew, for the cage that entrapped him was draining his life, pulling away his power and his grandeur and his knowledge, wearing him down until exhausted sleep finally claimed what was left and the dreams rose within him again. Worse things than if could have ever imagined, or conjured while awake, would come to torment him in those dreams. He would wake screaming anew and scream until the leeching effects of his prison would exhaust him again. It was an eternal cycle, one he had been unable to break, as strong and as eternal as the bars of his cage. Lord Ith's cage was finely crafted of water silver, its bars as clear and opulescent as a frozen waterfall. The stretch were as thin as gossamer and tough as steel. Lord Ith knew their strength, for he had rallied against the bars in the long nights of his incarceration. Far above him, in the great banquet halls of the Citadel, the magicians and enchantresses dined on water silver plates and cut their meat with blades made of the metal. But for Lord Ith, the water silver's purpose was to hold him tight, like an insect mounted for display and dissection. The cage itself was strung on water silver chains over an abyss, a blackness so deep that not even Ith knew of its true limits. The abyss had always been here, before the conclave had been founded, before the now vanished monks of artifice had made it their home, before the time of the brothers and their unholy war that had wrecked the world. The bars of the cage glowed faintly, a cold pale luminescence found only in fireflies and certain varieties of mushrooms. Indeed, the bars shone with great intensity than they had a moment before. His cage recognized when he was thinking, when he was sane, and reacted accordingly. It would eventually be too tired to think straight, and the exhaustion would take him, sending him down into the madness of his dreams. It was always that way, in those few moments of lucidity. He would begin to think, begin to gather his thoughts, and the bars of his cage, carefully crafted and ensorcelled, would try to steal those thoughts from him. He had little time, he knew. It cleared his mind for a moment, and thought of lands above, of the sprawling castle that towered beneath soot gray sky, of the great hills and marshlands that surrounded it. Once he had dreamed of a great labyrinth that would someday surround this domain and frustrate all but the most intent of travelers. That day was dead now, and so many dreams had died. The bars of his cage grew brighter. For the moment, the water silver already leeching his power from him. It filled his mind with the memory of his lands, of his former lands, of the lands now held by the usurper. A small flame of rage flared deep in Ith's soul at the thought of the usurper, but the mage put down the thought and concentrated only on the lands he had not seen in years. Once he had filled his thoughts with those memories, Ith unlocked a small parcel in the back of his mind, and that part was still mostly sane, 
a part that the power of the cage and things in his dreams had not yet reached. Lord Ith could feel the energy within himself rise, then peak, and then pass out of him as he sent a plaintive mental summoning out into the world. The bars brightened momentarily, then faded. Ith could do nothing to affect his cage, and indeed his spells only strengthened his power. He had tried before and failed. No, this new spell reached beyond the bars. Ith could only hope that the enchantments of his cage would not suck all the power from his conjuration. The spell stole precious energy from him, and for a moment, Lord Ith blacked out. No, perhaps he only imagined he had blacked out. Perhaps he imagined he cast the spell in the first place. The bars were already dimming again, and he noted dispassionately that his hands were clenching the metal spider's web before him so that knotted muscles pulsed around his wrist. Was it all a dream? wondered Ith, and he felt the darkness within himself rising again, threatening to overwhelm his tentative hold on consciousness. He let go of the bars and stood there, his fist balled now at his sides, his long fingernails digging into his palms. He felt the pain in his hands, and the pain drove back the darkness for a moment. It was good to feel anything at all. Far in the distance, there was the sound of a door opening, of keys jangling in the lock, of rusted hinges creaking as they flexed, and the soft whumping noise of an oak door striking the stone wall. Then another sound. This one, the clipped noise of a well-soled leather boot striking stonework, descended to where his cage hung above the abyss. The shadows cast by an approaching lantern danced along the walls. For a moment, he thought of his summoning, of his sharp mental imploring, and allowed himself the luxury of thinking that the light was in response to his call. No, he corrected himself. The one he sought would have not needed keys to enter this place, nor worn hard-soled boots, nor needed a torch. It was the pretender, the usurper, Mersol, the one who had thrown Ith in his cage of mystic metal and taken over his position as Magus alumni, as first among equals as the ruler of the conclave. The usurper was the only one who knew where Ith was, the only one who could come visit him unsummoned. The darkness made an attempt to seize Ith's mind and drag him back down into madness. It keened and wailed, imploring him to let go of the light of lucidity, to flee into its warm heart of insanity. Ith imagined physical gremlins hovering around him and seeking to protect him from Mersol, to drag him back to safety in the depths of his tortured dreams. The old mage fought off the temptation. At least he had thought he had fought off the temptation. Though when his mind grew clear enough for him to focus again, the usurper was standing just a few feet away. Mersol the Pretender was dressed sumptuously, as if he had just left a feast, which he likely had. His cape was made of cloth of gold, and trimmed at the neck and sleeves with ermine. The shirt and pants beneath were made from a velvet of hue so deeply purple as to appear a part of the night sky. His face was masked, and Ith remembered with a start that mask had been in a fashion when he had been first in prison. The pretender's was made of gold and encircled his eyes and covered his nose, making him look like a predatory bird. Spikes from above the eyepieces followed his high brow into the long dark hair that was swept back over his shoulders. Again, it made him seem like a bird of prey. It has been a while, said Marisol, his voice smooth and soothing. It noticed that as Marisol spoke, he stroked an oversized ruby on his right ring finger. Nearly a year since you last well enough to chat. We feared we lost you entirely. It said nothing. In his mind, he would play out such conversations. Conversations where Ith reduced Marisol to emotional rubble with nothing more than a few choice phrases. But when Marisol came to visit, the words and venom within the older man boiled up to the surface so fast that he sounded little more than a dog barking. So Ith now held his tongue. Not that anyone has been asking about you, really, continued the pretender in the face of Ith's silence. Most have forgotten about you entirely. It's been a decade, you know, but I remembered you, old friend. A warm quicksilver smile blossomed beneath the hawkish mask. Oh yes, I remember you. Ith realized that his hands were still clenched, and he slowly, purposefully opened them. He regarded Marisol as one would regard a venomous serpent. I knew you'd be up and around, though, continued the pretender. I could feel your power flicker through your toys. He reached beneath his rope and pulled out a wand. Its handle had a grip like that of a saber and was crafted of the same alloy of water silver that now held it in place. At its tip, the wand pulsed with a pale piece of quartz. No, not quartz, thought it, the memory bubbling up from the base of his brain, but a power stone, one of the few that had survived the last battle when Urza and Mishra had attempted to destroy the world. It thought he held himself motionless, but something must have given him away, for Mersol laughed, a raucous laugh like that of a crow. Ah, you recognize your toys, old friend? 
then you should know that this one has been most useful in ferreting out dissent and prompting confessions. That is how I know that no one truly misses you, and most have forgotten that you were even here. Again the pretender laughed. The pale pinkish power stone flashed briefly, and then it was gone. The wand scrolled away beneath the opulent cape. But I remember you. Oh yes, I still remember enough to keep a close watch on you. It was meant to be a haunting taunt, but it saw through it. After all these years, Mersel still feared him. Mersel had felt the softest tugging of its magical power far below and had come running to make sure that his former mentor was still in prison. That warmed Ith's heart a little. Trapped in a cage above a bottomless pit, buried beneath the catacombs of his own castle, he still frightened the pretender. It was small solace, but it was enough, and for the moment, it kept the darkness at bay. I take it you haven't given any more thought to my offer, said Marisol, his face suddenly stern and his manner direct. Ith blinked and searched his mind for any such offer. All he found were wide, blank spaces of darkness. Parts of his memory, he thought, that had already been eaten by the gremlins from within his dreams. Motionless and silent, he just stared at Marisol. It would be such a simple matter to tell me, you know, said Marisol, his voice a little tenuous. To buy your freedom with a few simple words. It continued to stare at Marisol. His voice was raw from screaming, so that his throat hurt even to breathe. But he felt no need to scream. Not now. You can't save yourself, said Marisol crossly. He was fidgeting with the great red gemstone on his ring. All your knowledge will die with you if you continue to act like this. Come on, old friend. I know you better than this. I was once your student, and you trusted me in all things. Give up. Don't let your pride kill your knowledge. Tell me what I want to know. Ith could feel the gremlins moving about the base of his brain, but he kept his jaw shut and his eyes leveled on the usurper. Ith knew he would not last much longer before the darkness spread into the rest of his mind and dragged him back down into sedate madness. I have your citadel, said Marisol, and suddenly the wand was out again from beneath his cloak, its gemstone tip now glowing like blood. I have your weapons, your followers, your magics. What do you have that I cannot obtain? Your very existence is being sucked dry. I could spare you all of this. Tell me what I need to know. Tell me Urza's secret. The words were like a key to the last of its sanity, a great iron key scrapping as it turned in a rust-pitted lock. The tumblers, oiled but unused for years, clicked and fell into place, and Ith knew what Mirsal was seeking. What Mirsal, who controlled everything that had once been Ith's, had been denied. Again, Ith knew why he had been trapped in his cage, but not slain when the pretender had usurped his title and his position at the head of the table. Ith now remembered what Mirsal wanted. The former Lord High Mage stared at the pretender, and the corners of the older man's mouth drew upward a fraction. It was only the mere shadow of a smile, but it was a smile nonetheless. Marisol saw the smile and cursed, his mouth a twisted sneer beneath the golden mask. He raised the wand and lightning danced around the tip. Then the lightning sprang to the cage, its electrical fires twisting and spinning around the water silver bars and jabbing into the old mage's flesh. It howled as the power of the wand coursed through him and around him. Yes, that was how these conversations usually ended. The gremlins at the base of his mind whispered. He would frustrate Marisol and the pretender would take petty revenge on Ith's flesh. Ith blacked out. It was a dreamless state, safe from both Marisol and the gremlins. It was merely oblivion, and Ith slowly regained his senses. He realized that he missed the sensation. Perhaps provoking Marisol was worth something after all. How long Ith remained unconscious, he did not know. What he did know was that when his mind finally cleared again, Marisol was gone. He had not heard the pretender's boots strike against the stonework as he stormed out of the catacombs nor heard Marshall's curses, nor heard the far-off door slam hard into its jam. He could imagine all that happening, and that was enough. Unless he thought, he'd imagine the entire discussion in the first place. No, Ith reassured himself. Marisol the usurper had been here, filled with pride and foolishness as always. The old mage's hand still hurt from where he grabbed the bars, from where the dancing lightning had scarred him. Marisol had been here. Now someone else was here as well. It took a moment for Ith to realize that he was not alone. The newcomer stood motionless where Marisol had been moments, hours, days, before. He was a tall, lanky imitation of a man, a man who had been stretched on a rack and healed in a now-lengthened form. The creature's wrist hung down to his knees, and his head slouched forward from huge, humped shoulders. He was wrapped in old clothes and rotting rags, layer upon decaying layer. 
The creature's fingers were pale and blue, but his face was hidden beneath the folds of his hood. He was waiting for If to speak. It took the former Lord High Mage a long time to realize that this was his being he cried out for with his plaintive spell. If himself had called this ragged creature forth from his hiding place, more keys turned in his mind, and he remembered who and what this creature had once been and how it served If now. If struggled, the encounter with Marisol had taken too much out of him. Already, he could feel the darkness at the bottom of his brain surging upward, eager to claim him into its form of oblivion. Exhaustion had made him weak, had made him vulnerable, and sleep would claim him soon. For if sleep meant not the peace of unconsciousness, but dark visions of deadly things, things that, once thought of, would drive the thinker mad. If had been thinking of those deadly things a great deal of late. Help me, he rasped to the creature, his voice as leathery as the tattered boots the rag creature wore. The creature made no move, for he was powerless against the cage as if. The captive mage shook his head, trying to keep the darkness at bay through sheer force of will. It would not be denied. Seek help, he said instead to the ragged cloaked man. Bring me one with the key. Bring me one who carries the secret. Bring him to me, so he may set me free. The ragged creature nodded, or at least looked as if he nodded to Ith, and turned away. But Ith was already slipping back again, into the madness that haunted him. He began to slip through the darkness, into the dreams where gremlins conspired to steal away every trace of reality and threatened to destroy all memory of what had come before. Already, the events of the recent past were fading. Ith wondered if he had imagined the ragged figure, or the conversation with his former traitor student, or even the cage that held him. Those images blended with the dreams of dark flesh gremlins that now seemed to burrow out of his skin. Deep beneath the citadel of the conclave of mages, Lord Ith let out a high, keen wailing of madness as the darkness consumed him. Once begun, it seemed that he began screaming forever. <laughs>